Thank you for downloading this programme from BBC Radio 4. In the bottom line this week, Evan Davis speaks to three business leaders about the challenges of doing business in and out of Africa. Hello and welcome to the programme. We're going to talk about business in Africa today, so let's start with some facts. It is home to a seventh of the world's population, but it produces only a fortieth of the world's output. Now, there are two ways to interpret that. You can take it as a sign that Africa is poor and thus of little interest to business, or you can take it as a sign that it has enormous potential to grow, just as China did before its liftoff a couple of decades ago. Well, already some African economies are stars in the World Growth League table. So how optimistic should we be? Well, we have three guests to talk about business in Africa. And I think fair to say each of you more interested in the potential for growth there rather than the negative stories. Let's meet each of my guests. And first up is Andrew Rugasira, chief executive of the Ugandan Coffee Company. It's called Good African Coffee and available in UK supermarkets, Andrew. Absolutely. Good African Coffee works with a network of 14,000 coffee farmers in Uganda. And we add value to the coffee in Uganda and export it to British supermarkets. We've been doing this for the last eight years. So what value do you add? Have you built huge processing plants? What we have, we have a roasting and packing plant in Kampala. So we buy the coffee from the farmers who we help with agronomy best practices. We organize them into cooperatives, buy their coffee at premium prices, roast it in Kampala and put it on the shelves in the UK and online in the US. It had never happened before uh, 2005, which is a shame in a way that, you know, if we're producing 20% of the global production of coffee, not to have a value-added or, or processed brand on the shelves. But we're doing that now, and it's, it's been quite exciting to see actually the, the growth in the regional coffee market as well. You know, coffee shops are coming up in Africa. We run three in Uganda when we started. There are only two now. There are about two dozen in Kampala. So, you know, the, the kind of behaviours for consumption of coffee are also changing. So there's great potential both in Africa and also in the global market. You had to really make quite an effort, didn't you, to sort of upgrade the coffee. It wasn't always considered the best coffee in the world, Ugandan coffee. Kenyan coffee was regarded pretty well and other places around the world. What did you do to, um, to get the farmers to produce the coffee that was increasingly in demand? We focused on quality. And part of quality is management at the farm level. So how the farmers handled their coffee trees, how they pruned the trees, how they mulched, how they used organic best practices, and how they worked together using some of the appropriate technologies. They then linked premium pricing to quality. And then immediately, you know, a light bulb went off. I mean, sorry, Rupert. <laughs> light bulb went off there. And they began to realize if we invest more in quality, so we get the knowledge to produce a good quality coffee, we get a better price. And then we would then buy that coffee, roast it, and roast it to international standards. The problem has not been about the quality of coffee. The problem has been access to market to get producers to appreciate the kind of quality and products that are needed in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Well, also with us is Herman Chinnery Hesse, who's co-founder of the Ghana-based software company, Softribe. And actually, Herman, you've got more than one software business. Yes, Why don't you do. tell us what your businesses do? Okay, I run two companies. One is the Soft Tribes, a software company. We've been doing software development for 20 years. And then around five years ago, we set up another company called Black Star Line that does e-commerce. And it seeks to bring to, to the international trading uh, arena the ordinary, especially rural, African merchants. So that um, e-commerce, we are using e-commerce as a mechanism for them to be able to trade their wares across the world. Mm. So and that then, second one is it's, yeah. it's kind of like an eBay. So traders yeah, can put their... Th you, you provided a platform. Exactly. For, an African eBay, African PayPal. But this time uh, plugged into a transport system because we, we assume that uh, a poor guy in the bush hasn't got the means to get something transported to Sweden. So we're doing that for them too. You make global businesses out of cottage industries. Exactly, in a way. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and cottage industries that may not exist already. The skills are there, but there's no opportunity, so they haven't been pursued and turned into businesses. I don't necessarily mean tables and chairs and xylophones. There could be some poet guy in rural Uganda. We might find Russians like his poetry and are happy to pay $2 a month to listen to his poetry. All kinds of strange things. I said in my office... Uh, today, we're signing up the merchants. I've seen all manner of things. Leather, sandals, snakeskin shoes, bush meat, so, so, and all kinds of things. And you started Soft Tribe, I mean yourself, and from your, your own bedroom, as I understand it. Yes, I did. I, I moved to Ghana in 1990 from the UK. 
and uh, I didn't have money to set up industry. And I studied manufacturing, and I realized, hey, I, I own a PC, and it's sitting right in front of me. It, it can be a factory, and it can make software. So we started developing software on the PC and selling, you know, cold but, uh, turkey. I mean, not everyone can just set up a software factory, as you call it. I mean, it takes a bit of wherewithal. Where did you get the software programmers? It, okay, no, I, I wrote the programs myself initially. Right. Uh, it was a hobby that I had. I'd always, I did well in robotics in, in university. So I started playing around with computers. And, and, then, and so that hobby then I turned into a business. How many people do you employ now? Um, like 40, 50. We, we've been, times when we've been over 100, but we downsized with the global economy. Right. So <laughs> it, goes, it goes up and down. Well, also with us, uh, returning to the programme, is Rupert Soames, who's chief executive of the um, power suppliers Agreco. You better explain again what Agreco does, Rupert, but it's essentially we do see your generators around, and there are a lot of them in Africa as well as in the West. Yeah, we supply power to people when they need it, either in a hurry or for a short period of time. We did the temporary power for the Olympics here in London. We do everything from butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, right up to huge oil refineries <coughs> where we supply power if they just need it for a few weeks or a few months, across to doing whole countries where we will uh, move them. This is particularly the case in, in Africa, where we are supporting the grid in upwards of 20 countries now in Africa. Um, and it's, it's mostly going to be diesel, is that right? So you basically you can well, bolt on diesel now, units. Funny enough, increasingly now it's gas. Right. We've made a big investment in, in, in gas, uh, part, and wherever you can use gas, you want to do it. The problem is getting hold of the gas. But where we can't use gas, we use diesel. Right, now a rather, perhaps a, a big thing, but not untypical, is your, your deal in Mozambique. Why don't you just tell us about that? Yeah, well, that's a... really interesting because the Mozambicans have great gas resources which they were exporting to South Africa. And what we've done is built a power station now in Mozambique. So instead of exporting gas, they're exporting electricity. And obviously there's a huge amount of value added that goes in that process. And the whole area is having its power supply supported by this plant. And I think I'm right in saying, in fact, the other two of you may have views on this, power is something that's just a bit short in Africa. I mean... Pretty well every country just needs a bit more, doesn't it? Is that not right? Understatement. <laughs> Understatement. Yeah, the average African business has a park up 56 days a year. Yeah. And I, my hats go off to you, you know, running the businesses that you uh, mm. uh, do, because presumably, what do you have? Do you have your own generators? or Generators, what? yes. I mean, mm. solar in, in some yeah. respects in the rural economy, yes. I mean, yeah. it really increases the cost of money. But it's the hugely money. expensive. It's a huge burden that a lot of African businesses have to do. They have to go and get their home generators. Well, it, it takes us, you know, into a, a more general conversation about business in Africa. Now, this is my own observation, which is how much harder it is to do everything in a country that doesn't already have everything on tap. If you want to set up a business and you don't have electricity, it's my, you're my huge disadvantage compared to businesses in countries that do have electricity. Or you, if you don't have a trained workforce, I mean, maybe mm. just give us some of your experiences from the battlefield, really, in terms of having to start at a place mm. way before where a business in the West mm. or in... In other places, I mean, the, the heart of it, and that's what I've really written about, is these constraints that make you uncompetitive. If I have a business that's accessing capital at 28%, for example, interest mm. per annum, and I'm competing with a UK coffee company that has access to loans at 7%, I can't be competitive. If they have access to technologies that make them produce their products at low cost, more efficiently, you know, I can't compete. The skilled labor you're talking about, Evan, you know, we had to bring in expatriate roasters to help train our own Ugandan roasters to be able to roast the coffee. The technology, the know-how, the skills have to all be brought in in order for us to produce a product or a service that's, that's going to have a chance of being competitive. And in a sense, it's how quickly can we bridge that gap? You know, how quickly can we leap those technology skill gaps? And I think the opportunity in Africa is that we can actually produce these products and services and deliver them at a good price if we can just begin to see the infrastructure being put in place and the capital going to these areas where the markets have really failed. But Herman, I mean, take a business like yours, software, which is cutting edge, you know, up-to-date stuff. How do you get started in Africa? Well, there are ways around it. I mean, like for me, we, we grew up in Africa. We were gangsters. We understand the, the terrain. Basically, out of my bedroom, we started SoftDrive. And uh, we grew it organically. Every time we sold software, we'll buy another PC on credit and we'll pay in nightmare scenarios where uh, 
our PC supplier that I, I will walk into our office and say, you owe me money. He said, we, we're going to get paid soon after this job, then we'll pay you for the second PC. And we grew like that, and then bigger and bigger, entered the multinationals, and did a little work with government. The biggest problem I find, which underlies all the issues that I think we're talking about, the biggest problem is that there seems to be some kind of cabal. The donor community, our politicians, and foreign business. They seem to be on one side, and then local business is, seems to be their adversary on the other side. Our governments don't have to depend on taxes to survive because the donor community will give them money. If they had to depend on taxes from us, they would put in the infrastructure to make our lives easier for us to be able to pay ah. our taxes. This is the problem. I'm enjoying listening to your big reflections on the continent and its politics. I want to hear more about life on the ground, yeah. for the, the problems you face every day. We've talked a bit about power. Yeah. Andrew, you're, you, just tell us how you went about, I mean, how you go out there from scratch. Hmm and get a business going. Yeah. I mean, it's harder. There's no template. There's no sort of roadmap which you just follow. It's much more challenging. Yeah. No? Uh, and that's really the challenge of entrepreneurship in a real sense, you know, having an idea, having a vision, and seeing that vision through. But the journey was also an opening into the reality of trying to export, accessing markets, Evan. You know, I mean, it took me 14 trips to come to the UK to convince supermarkets to take our products. You know, they'd never dealt with an African small to medium well, there's enterprise. there's no established supply route. Absolutely. So it just seems and, like, and well... 14 times flying back and forth, two and a half years. And, and I went to school and, here. And you're, the yeah, language. You, and what were they worried about? They, They'd just never done business with, a, with an African small company. Right. If that's that's not difficult. I mean, for, for me who went to school here, who has some advantages, just imagine all the entrepreneurs who would love to get their products here. People think of Africa exporting. Actually, Africa is 57 countries who can actually happily export to each other. And it's not exports that do it, that create the wealth. It's trade that does it. And it doesn't really matter whether you're trading with somebody 50 miles away, 500 miles away, or 5,000 miles away. Because the big opportunity in Africa is that China built their prosperity on exporting. And they've now got a situation where they're now having to create the growth internally. For the Africa's opportunity is to build its future with trade as much between each other as the outside world. That's got to be right, hasn't it? Because there are, as you say, 57 countries. Actually, I thought it was 54, but you've been saying 57. I'm sure, uh, Depends whether you include the islands. Right, so 50-something countries yeah. and a lot of boundaries between mm. them. And mm. Is it easy to trade between African countries? There are real issues there. And, I mean, if you look at the volumes of trade within African countries, it's about 10%, you know. I mean, 10% of total merchandise trade is within African countries. In North America, it's 40%. You know, 40% yeah. of the trade is between it's North right. American countries. In the EU, it's 63%. Yeah. There's it, huge it, it is yeah. huge, good, is huge it? opportunity. But, you know, look at the cost of doing business. You can get a container from Dubai to Mombasa for about $1,800 shipped. That same container will cost you about three thousand eight hundred to four thousand five hundred dollars from Mombasa to Kampala. You know? Just pause for a moment there. You're listening to the Bottom Line with Andrew Rugasira of Good African Coffee uh, from Uganda, Herman Chinnery Hesse of Soft Tribe, uh, a software company uh, based in Ghana, and Rupert Soames of the British company Agreco. Um, can we talk about this issue of the reverse brain drain? Mm. Africans outside of Africa returning home. I mean, you two, Andrew and Herman, both, I think you'd say, fall into that category, essentially, yes? What well, made I you think, go uh, back? I uh, think Andrew? I was an expatriate student here and I went back home. <laughs> right. But a good example is my sister, I mean, who went to school here, my younger sister, worked here and then now is working with Lafarge in Tanzania, you know, and was headhunted here and recruited here and went back home and is, is working on as comparable uh, an expat package as if they'd hired someone from abroad so you're having a lot of that but there are a lot of africans in the diaspora and they're not going back home 
just because of an emotional uh, or political <coughs> persuasion. They're going home because they are opportunities. It's not only in business that this is happening, it's also in government. And if you look at the governments Good now in that. many parts of Africa, they are populated by people who've been educated at Stanford and where, who 20 years ago wouldn't have dreamt of coming back, yeah. Yeah. but actually now have come back. And that's one of the things that I think is driving yeah. government to be better, is that there is a noticeable difference about the number of uh, people who had previously left Africa coming back to go either into business but actually also into government. Herman, was it a dilemma for you whether to stay in the life in the West or to go back? No, not a chance. Not a chance. I mean, I arrived in America and it was okay. The school was fine. I was studying engineering and it was fine, but I was black. I was a second class citizen. It wasn't going to work out. You didn't want to stay? No, no way. No, no I, of... I, I argue further that most Africans don't want to stay. They just can't. The circumstances are not right for them to go back. Mm -hmm. it, it's not easy for us here. You know, we, we manage. But, I mean, he, Andrew, so you can ask him too. I'm sure. London is particularly okay, but other places are not easy at all for, for us to live in. And, uh, you mean for, for black for people, black, people, black yeah, Africans? For Africans? Yeah, for black Africans. It's, it's quite difficult. And working around as a second class citizen, mm -hmm. we're just not used to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, like, I remember going to high school in, in, in the U.S. before I went to college. I went to high school for a year. And I'll say hello to people who just walk past in Texas. And uh, I didn't know what racism was. And it struck me after a week that, ah, that's that stuff we saw in Roots. That's the racism thing. But, but we, we, had, we just had no clue what it was. We didn't grow up with it. So my, my, my perspective is that Africans should go home. That really, is it. You know? I mean, I really strongly believe that. Uh, and I think there are enough opportunities uh, than living in an environment where your dignity is not respected or where you feel that you're undervalued. Go home. And there are huge opportunities. I think the struggle for an entrepreneur on the continent, I think, is no different than if you try to struggle here. But mm -hmm. at home, he's got a different environment. Is he can create for himself the dignity and the space to do what his dreams are. So I always encourage people to go home when they say, oh, look, it's tough here. You know, what should we do? My answer, which normally makes people laugh, is go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it. And it's not because for some reason it's going to be easier at home, but the issue of human dignity is so important. And also, it's not a... Nobody's going to build Africa for us. <laughs> Why should you come and build Africa? It's, it's our problem. It's not, it's not your problem. My forefathers didn't come here and play Winston Churchill and build England. Well, I, I think people who are not looking to invest in Africa are going to miss out on one of the greatest investment opportunities of the next 20 years. And I, you know, I, a lot of this is going to be sorted out by the market. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's going to be sorted out by the market because people will go home, they will see the opportunities, they will make money, they will suck in investment, and with opportunities to make money, the investment will follow. But Rupert, do you feel uncomfortable when you hear the other two here who are more African, who've created African companies as opposed to a British company doing business in Africa. Do you feel a bit uncomfortable at the idea that there's a kind of separation between, if you like, good African business and foreign businesses who are the intruders coming in from outside? Well, I'm a mere humble servant. We are the servants of their governments and their utilities, and we're there to serve them. They don't want us to kick us out in the same way that we do business in South America and, and Asia. And I've not felt for one second that this sort of black-white thing was a, a problem for me in doing this because I am a servant of the government. Mm. And but, 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 but Herman was saying that there's a cabal of foreign businesses and government and, and, and I'm just wondering whether, in a sense, that makes you feel uncomfortable as... Well, it, it makes me uncomfortable that he thinks that, but it's not my personal experience that that is the uh, case. But, but I can under, uh, understand. I, mean, I certainly feel like a second-class citizen to the extent I'm not a citizen of the country when I'm in, a, in Africa. I'm mean, second class, but I, you know, I'm not a citizen there. But I think we've got to get over this, and it's much more positive, as Andrew was saying, go home and make money because there's more opportunity there. Can you see growth rates of, say, 10%? I think Africa's had growth rates of 5% over mm. the last decade. Ghana, can you 14 there's some stars that are like Ghana that have done very, very well. Mm. Can you see a continent-wide China-type experience kicking off in Africa? I think you can, and, and if you read the McKinsey report, the problem is not the 6-7% growth rate. I think the problem is how that growth rate trickles down to the rest of the demographic. That's where the real challenge is. You have these high growth rates, but they're not spread out across the whole population. I mean, if you look at growth in agriculture, it's been anemic on the continent. Right. And yet, 
agriculture has been proven to be able to prosper economies by two to four times than any other sector. And yet the growth is anemic. Industrial growth has also been tittering. But, but growth in... I mean, look, the, because, the way other countries have made themselves rich is by taking people out of low-value agriculture and putting them into high-value manufacturing industries. Exactly. That's what China did, it's what Japan did, it's what Europe did, exactly. it's what Britain did 200 exactly. years ago. Exactly. Uh, uh, the why is it going? not happening in Africa? Where is the capital going? Just look at where the capital is going. Where is FDI going? Where is the capital going? It's going into oil and gas... It's going to the extractive industries. It's going into the minerals. It's, you it, mean it's the foreign direct investment is going into those areas? Yeah, uh, the it, mineral it's, it's sovereign funds are going You're in ruined that by the fact you've got so many resources uh, yeah. in some uh, sense. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's distracting. Absolutely. But these GDP figures, you have to be really careful. First of all, that they are averages, and you've got sort of countries that are basket cases at the bottom who are not growing at all, and then yeah. countries are growing at 14%. Yeah. Secondly, is a lot of this GDP is jobless GDP. Yeah. You know, you go to a huge mine in, um, say, Zambia, and there is one person <laughs> driving this enormous digger and five other people behind them, mm-hmm. uh, producing enormous amounts of GDP growth on the extractive industries. And um, I mean, the thing that I find absolutely perverse is that we in Europe go and pour large amounts of aid into uh, uh, Africa, and then we go and put trade barriers are getting them saying they can't export uh, agricultural product. And it's 32% of the economy. And if Africa is going to trade, one of the things it has to, has to do is to get its agriculture uh, competitive and sorted out, because that is not jobless GDP. No, that is... And I'm, you're nodding very vigorously. The um, cabal. The cabal. Beware the cabal. But, but, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the, the tragedy, Evan, is... I mean, the EU budget, I was shocked to listen to the British Prime Minister giving his statement in Parliament uh, about, about the agreement in Brussels. You know, the EU budget, EU for, budget agri- yeah, for agriculture yeah. is almost 40% uh, for agriculture. Mm-hmm. Agriculture which contributes, what, 2% uh, of GDP. I, I doubt it's that much, actually. Uh, one point yeah. something, and yeah. employs something like 5% of the workforce. Mm-hmm. I doubt it's that much, either. I, yeah. mean, I mean, there you go. And, and that's a wall, a structural wall, blocking yeah. a lot of goods uh, coming up from Africa uh, to, to, to the market here. I mean, and that's, that's, that's not just unjust, it's not unfair, it, it's almost criminal because you're denying households the opportunity to make a living and a living to take care of themselves and you're still getting public sector money and investing in those economies as aid. It's, but it's, it's worse than that because you're not only denying African families the ability to go and make money and export, you're denying European exactly. families the right to have quality African product. I mean, exactly. Why, well, why yeah, can't I buy yeah, my yeah. sugar from Africa? We're pushing the price of our own food up yeah, in yeah, order yeah. to keep Africans. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, okay, so Herman, you're I can see you mouthing the word, beware the cabal. Beware the cabal. This cabal beware of Western cabal. governments. Yeah, I, don't buy this. I, 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 I don't buy this, this too much conspiracy theory about this. I think there are really tricky issues between aid and agricultural barriers to trade. It's one of those paradoxes that we, we need to work through because, frankly, what we need to do is to have more trade and particularly I think it's absurd that we have um, uh, any form of restriction of imports and exports between Africa and the rest of the world. Why would we want that? But alas, we do. Let's perhaps uh, sort of draw to a close by asking how optimistic you are about the growth rates. It's been a pretty good decade for Africa. There have been false storms before on that continent, though, haven't there? There have been other decades when it's looked good. Um, Herman, how optimistic are you? This time it'll be something that'll stick. Very, very optimistic. I think that, uh, uh, thankfully, our natural resources are selling well. We now have two buyers in the market, There's the traditional buyers and China. Right, so, so let's push your prices up. We can yep. negotiate, yep. so that's helping. Um, thanks, thank God for the internet. We can communicate, bypassing anything, on SMS. It means also that the kids in our country can see what's happening in other parts of the world through the internet. They can watch their YouTube, their MTV and everything. So now we've all heard about a Rolls Royce Phantom. And we all want one. Raises so, aspiration. Exactly. And yeah. Okay. And, and because of the technology now, we are able to do businesses uh, that we couldn't do before. At the very minimum, the African in the bush can be communicated with today. Um, strangely also, 30 years ago or so, our countries were in a bit of a mess. 
forced us all to go and live abroad. So we've seen how you guys do your operation. It's not bad at all. And we've kind of learned a bit on <laughs> how to practice and how to get uh, our governments to support us to do business. And uh, things are changing. And if you, if you look at the politics, the discussions in Africa today, our governments are under extreme pressure from the young population with their bright future and their knowledge uh, of MTV. They know what they want. And, and that is the broad direction. And I, I think things are very, very good for us today. I'm actually jealous of my kids because they're going to have a good life. So I think the younger generation, uh, they're not shackled by a lot of the history, uh, a lot of the struggles. Uh, I think they're just, you know, they're clear market agents. You know, they want jobs, they want opportunities to create wealth, and they want it now. Yes. And they're becoming vocal and they're becoming louder and they've seen how the other world lives. And, and they'll create the growth. I mean, because whether we like it or not, biology is taking over. Three quarters of the population will be under 25. And jobs have to be created for them. And they need the capital. They need the opportunity. They need the enabling environment. And I think, in a way, they will make governments more accountable. You know, governments represent the people. And not all the time do they represent their interests, but they're forced on most occasions to address the concerns of the people. So I think the next decade will see a lot more participatory uh, politics with, with governments being more and more accountable to a younger population who's not beholden to the historical struggles that uh, the older generation yeah. has had. To they're not impressed that you were fighting not, Westerners in the Imperial they're, they're, War no, 50 no, years or, ago. No, no, you're in the bush of yeah. some guerrilla struggle. Yeah, no, yeah. They, they, they want... We actually they want, want good performance, they not, want service not delivery his, today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's tempting to say that in Africa, this time it's different. I think that slack use of language, I think there's a better analogy, which is a snowball, is that there is a snowball rolling down the hill and it's gathering momentum and see, and each rotation the snowball is getting bigger, which gives it faster forward momentum. We're talking about a continuum, and I do completely agree that one of the things that has held Africa back has been a sort of chippiness about the colonial past that the young just don't have. Uh, they're much more interested in where's the money, how do I do the service, and letting mm. the market uh, operate. But I think that this forward momentum of Africa now is so well established now, I think it's pretty much unstoppable, Thank and it's, a lot of it is helped by the technology of the internet and the uh, mobile communications. Well, that is a very good note on which to draw to a close. I apologise for us talking about the whole of Africa in one programme. We are aware it is a lot of different countries, a lot of different cultures and different places. Uh, let me just thank my guests, Andrew Ragasira of Good African Coffee, Herman Chinnery Hesse of Soft Tribe and Rupert Soames too of Agreco. Uh, I'm going to be back with more guests next week. Thank you for listening to this programme from BBC Radio 4. The Bottom Line was presented by Evan Davis and the producer was Ben Carter.